everybody, this is CJ Caldwell, and I'm here to teach you how to play Eternal Kings. First, we're gonna to wanna to set up the board, so let's go ahead and get started. When you're ready to play Eternal Kings, the first thing you wanna do is construct your army and ability card deck. You could use our pre-made decks or construct your own. Your army consists of two rooks, two knights, two bishops, a king, a queen, and eight pawns. You'll lay these down on the board just like you will a normal chess game with the player who's going to move first putting their queen on white and the player who's going to move second putting their queen on black. You'll also construct your ability card deck. This is going to consist of exactly 16 ability cards. No more, no less. Once you have all this, you're ready to play and make your first move. So let's talk about movement. So the first thing a player will do on their turn is choose which creature they want to move. Now you can only move a creature that has a legal movement. So for example, obviously I couldn't choose to move my rook at the beginning of the game because it's stuck behind this pawn. But this is especially important in Eternal Kings, and we'll explain more why when we discuss abilities. For right now, I'll just choose to move the pawn in front of my king. Now every creature moves just like the chess piece that is located in the top right corner of their card. So I'll choose to move my pawn and move it up two spaces towards the center of the board. If you don't know how chess pieces move, we'll have a segment at the end of this video to discuss that more. So that might be the end of my turn. And on my opponent's turn, they're going to do the same thing. Choose which creature they'd like to move and move it. And let's just say they chose this pawn and they moved it up two spaces. Now during my next turn, I would no longer be able to move my pawn or choose to move my pawn because it has no legal movement. So instead, I might move out my knight in an L shape which is then threatening to attack the pawn in the center of the board. Now that we have a threat on the board, let's talk more about attacking. Okay, let's talk about attacking. When a creature attempts to move into an opponent's creature square, we call this an attack. So in this example, my knight can move into a square occupied by my opponent's pawn and attack and attempt to kill this pawn. To be able to kill the pawn, my knight needs to be able to do equal to or more damage than the pawn has health. If I'm unable to do enough damage to kill the pawn, the pawn's health will refresh at the beginning of the next turn. You can see how much damage my knight does by looking at the two swords here, and how much life the pawn has by looking at the hourglass of blood. The damage is not reciprocated during an attack, so only my knight will be dealing damage here. And as we can see, the knight does six damage and the pawn has five life. So that's more than enough to kill the pawn, in which case the pawn will be removed from the board and placed in my opponent's discard pile, and my knight will take that square. But let's just pretend my knight was unable to kill the pawn in the center of the board. If there's ever an unsuccessful attack, the attacking creature will then be placed in its previous square along its movement. So for a knight, it would just be placed to where it was before. But if I was to use a rook, well, the rook would move to attack the pawn, and if the attack was unsuccessful, it would be placed here in its previous square along its movement. Same thing goes for a bishop. If I was attacking from a bishop here, it would move to attack the pawn, and if it was unsuccessful, it would be then placed in its previous square along its movement. So just as a reminder, you'll find a creature's damage here with the two swords, its life with the hourglass of blood. But what about this symbol here? Well, this symbol represents a creature's discipline, and this is how creatures use abilities. So let's talk about creature abilities. All right, now that we've talked about movement and attacking, let's talk about what really makes this game special, abilities. Creatures can use abilities found either on their creature card or in their controller's hand. To use these abilities, they utilize their discipline stat found here. There are four different types of disciplines. Agility, Wisdom, Intelligence, and Strength. First, let's talk about abilities found on the creature card. Most creatures have an ability found towards the bottom of their card. Like this city miscreant has the ability to draw a card. But to do this, it must first pay its casting costs found here, which is four agility discipline to be subtracted from the total amount of discipline it has available found here, and flipping the card to its backside. That's what this symbol means. Now creatures can use their abilities before or after they move. So once I've chosen to move City of Miscreant on my turn, I can either use its ability by paying the casting cost and flipping it to its backside to draw a card and then move, 
or I can move the card and then use its ability by paying the casting cost to draw a card. That might be the end of my turn. A similar and more advanced example of this is with Agility's restricted pawn, Lenny the Lamplighter. Lenny has the ability target adjacent ally creature may move if it has not moved this turn. Now you're gonna see this word a lot in Eternal Kings, target, which simply just means the creature that you select. And adjacent means any square that is touching the square Lenny is occupying. So basically, Lenny can make any creature next to him move. And he can do this before or after his movement by first, of course, paying the casting cost of four discipline and also having to flip, Lenny will target my shopkeeper here. Once he's used his ability, he still, of course, has to complete his movement before shopkeeper can take his. So I'll move Lenny up two spaces. Now that Lenny is done with his movement, shopkeeper can take a movement. And during shopkeeper's movement, he can use his abilities before or after he moves. So I might flip him to draw a card and then move him up here to attack the center. Similarly, Lenny can use his ability after he moves. And this can create some really fun and unique combinations. Like I can move Lenny up one square, which will actually allow, put him in range to grant a movement to City Miscreant here. Once I've used my ability by paying its casting costs, Lenny can then give a movement to City Miscreant. City Miscreant can use his abilities before or after he moves. Maybe I'll draw a card by paying the casting cost and flipping him to his backside, and then move. And during his movement now, he could actually create an attack on Hellbeast diagonal to him. Since City Miscreant has five damage and Hellbeast has five life, that's enough damage to kill Hellbeast and send him to my opponent's discard pile. So you may have noticed since we use their abilities, City Miscreant and Lenny Lamplighter are flipped onto their backside in an exhausted state. The card is grayed out, they no longer have any discipline, and they don't have their normal abilities. Instead, they have the ability to flip back to their front side. That's what this symbol means. And it costs them zero discipline. However, creatures can only flip once per turn. And since we've already flipped them, we'll have to wait till the next time we move them to use the ability to flip them back to their front side. Now it's especially important, since they don't have any discipline left, it's gonna be a lot harder for them to use ability cards out of their controller's hands. So let's talk about ability cards. So let's talk about ability cards. Just like you have 16 creatures on the board, you have 16 cards in your ability deck. These are gonna be the only information you don't see immediately on the board, and that makes them especially powerful because they're unpredictable. Now most card games you draw every turn, but not in Eternal Kings. Instead, you have to use your creature abilities to draw a card. Like creature abilities, ability cards can be used before or after the creature moves. Consider these like extra abilities written on each creature, except they're in your hand, as hidden information. As long as a creature has enough discipline to pay the casting cost found on the top right corner of each ability card, it can use it before or after it moves. However, it also has to have the same type of discipline. So as we see with Chilling Breath, part of the intelligence realm, it has a blue shield and a red crown, the intelligence crown. This can be used by our Earth Apprentice since it has the same icon as type of discipline. However, our Mutated Brute, part of the strength realm, is unable to use the Chilling Breath because it has a different icon. So let me show you how I might use an ability card like Chilling Breath. Chilling Breath makes it so that a pawn adjacent to the creature casting Chilling Breath can't move on its opponent's next turn. So normally I wouldn't want to move my Earth Apprentice into the square because they'd just be killed by the Mutated Brute. But if I had Chilling Breath in my hand, I could subtract the four necessary discipline to cast Chilling Breath and freeze the Mutated Brute. That way he wouldn't be able to attack me on his next turn. Chilling Breath would then go into my discard pile and my Earth Apprentice would no longer have any discipline left, so he wouldn't be able to use his creature ability to draw a card or most other ability cards that I might have in my hand. It's important to note, though, that all discipline is refreshed at the beginning of every turn. So once my opponent starts their turn, Earth Apprentice will have that four discipline back. But so let's just pretend that Earth Apprentice started his turn on his backside, where he has zero discipline. After I choose to move Earth Apprentice, I can use his creature ability to flip him back to his front side, and now he immediately regains that four discipline since it's shown on his card. After I move him, he'll be in range to cast Chilling Breath on Mutated Brute, freezing him so he won't be able to attack me on his next turn. 
Also, it's important to note that most ability cards do not require creatures to flip because there's no flip symbol in their casting cost. So let's talk about the two different types of abilities found in Eternal Kings, white cast and red cast. White cast abilities have their casting costs written in white and can only be used by the creature that you've chosen to move this turn. Let's take Ankh of Zol, for example. Its casting cost is two wisdom written in white. It says white cast on the card. And remember this symbol? Its ability is to simply just flip target adjacent creature. So during my turn, if I wanted, I could choose to use Initiative Vetus and use Ankh of Zol to flip an adjacent creature like my War Priest back to his front side. And then I would complete my Initiative Vetus's movement. However, if I chose to move the Initiative Vetus and did not use my Ankh of Zol, no other creature on the board could use it because it is a white cast ability. Remember, only the creature that you chose to move this turn can use a white cast ability. They can do it before they move or after they move, but only the creature you chose to move this turn can use it. Most abilities you find on your creature cards and in your ability card deck will be written in white as white cast abilities. However, some of your abilities will have their casting cost or text written in red. We call these red cast abilities. Red cast abilities can be used at any point in the game. Unlike white cast abilities, which can only be used before or after a creature moves, red cast abilities can be used by any creature at any point, whether it's moved or not this turn, even on my opponent's turn. So let's take an example from Miracle of Suffering. Miracle of Suffering is a red cast card that costs four wisdom and prevents one damage to the creature casting it this turn. If it's my opponent's turn and they want to try and kill my initiative Vetus with a mutated brute, they should be able to do that normally as the mutated brute does five damage and the initiative Vetus only has five life. So they might attack me thinking that that's what's going to happen. However, during the combat phase, if I have a Miracle of Suffering in my hand, they wouldn't know it, but I would be able to use the four discipline my initiative Vetus has to prevent one of those damage by using the Miracle of Suffering. I can only do this again because Miracle of Suffering is a red cast card, and we know it is because it has its casting cost written in red. Similarly, Wisdom's Knight War Priest has a red cast creature ability. We know this because the casting cost is also written in red. An ability is to prevent two damage to target adjacent ally creature this turn. So if the mutated brute tried to attack my initiative Vetus, I could use my War Priest ability, even though it's my opponent's turn and the War Priest hasn't moved, to save the initiative Vetus. The way that this would look is the mutated brute would move and attack my initiative Vetus. During the combat phase, I could choose to use my War Priest's ability, red cast ability, since it's written in red, to prevent the next two damage. I do this by spending the four discipline and flipping the War Priest and targeting the Initiative Vetus to prevent two damage. Since the Initiative Vetus has survived the attack, the Mutated Brute will be forced to move back to its previous square. At this point of the video, you've learned most of the important mechanics of Eternal Kings. However, there are some cards that use these mechanics in special and unique ways. So we'd like to talk to you more about those. So first, let's talk about Creature Alterations. Creature Alterations are ability cards that instead of being cast and placed into the discard pile, are attached onto the creature using it. It will move with that creature for the remainder of the game until it's either sacrificed or destroyed. So here's an example of a Creature Alteration, Signet of Intelligence. The way I would use Signet of Intelligence is just like any other ability card, by first paying its cost in the top right corner. I'll choose to do this with my Earth Apprentice, since he's the one I'll be moving this turn and he has four discipline. Unlike other ability cards that go directly into the discard pile, creature alterations instead attach onto the creature casting it, in this case, the Earth Apprentice. Now, not only does the Earth Apprentice have his creature ability to draw a card, but he also can use the creature alterations ability. It's important to note that creature alterations abilities can't be used the turn that they come into play. Rather, they'll be used later on in the game. So let me give you an example. If I had a Signet of Intelligence in my hand, on my turn I could choose to move my Earth Apprentice. Before or after he moves, I could cast a Signet of Intelligence on him. Now this isn't going to affect anything during my turn, but after my opponent makes a move, and it's my turn again, I have the option to move my Earth Apprentice again, but this time, not only will he have the option to draw a card, 
and use his creature ability, but also use the ability from the Signet of Intelligence. So let's see what that might look like. First, of course, after I choose the Earth Apprentice, I'm gonna to have to move him. So I'll, I'll choose to move him before I use my abilities. Next, I'll use his creature ability to draw a card by paying the four discipline and flipping him onto his backside. Normally, that would be the end of what, what this creature could do, but now that he has a creature alteration on him, he can sacrifice the Signet of Intelligence to shift one square forward. So I'll do that now by sacrificing the Signet, putting it into my discard pile, and moving the Earth Apprentice one square forward. So let's take a look at another creature alteration, one this time that has a red cast as part of its ability, the Signet of Agility. The Signet of Agility allows me to move a creature that hasn't already moved this turn. That kind of just basically allows me to move two pieces in one turn. The way that I would do this is, let's say it's my turn and I normally would only be able to move my city miscreant up one square and then maybe draw a card with him. But since I've attached the Signet of Agility onto my shopkeeper on a previous turn, I can use my Signet of Agility's ability to grant the shopkeeper of movement. Now I can only do this because the Signet of Agility's ability is written in red. And we know that that means it's a red cast ability. As we know, red cast abilities can be used at any time in the game, even by creatures that haven't already moved or that I've chosen to move during this turn. The way I'll do that is by sacrifice the Signet of Agility, put it into my discard pile, and this would grant the shopkeeper a movement. Now before or after his movement, I can use other abilities, like drawing a card or ability cards from my hand, but let's just say this time, I'll move the shopkeeper and then draw a card with him. And that might be the end of my turn. So let's talk about another unique card type in Eternal Kings, structures. Structures are ability cards that are placed into a square on the board and will remain there for the entirety of the game until used or removed. You cast structures just like any other ability card by first paying their casting costs found in the top right corner. But instead of going to the discard pile or on top of a creature, they will be placed into the same square that the creature occupies, typically underneath the creature, like this. Creatures can move into, through, or even end their turn on a structure. However, structures themselves do not move and will remain there until again used or destroyed. So let's get into it. Let me show you how we might use the structure Plague Land. Plague Land deals four damage to any enemy creature that starts their movement in it. So I might move my Hell Beast into this square, but that would be dangerous since it is under attack from Lenny the Lamplighter here. Knowing this, I might choose to place my Plague Land into that same square by first paying the two strength required to cast it and then placing it into the square that Hell Beast occupies. I usually do this by placing it underneath the creature. Now on my opponent's next turn, if they wanted to kill Hellbeast, they could do that because Lenny the Lamplighter does 5 damage and Hellbeast only has 5 life. But by doing so, they'd also be moving Lenny into the same square that Plague Land occupies. And as we know, any creature, enemy creature, that starts a turn in the square that Plague Land occupies will take 4 damage. And this will actually be enough damage to kill Lenny. So if he ends up trying to take another movement, he'll end up dying. So even though Lenny might be killed and removed from the board by Plague Land, Plague Land itself will remain on the board for the entirety of the game, unless removed or destroyed in some other way. Now just as a reminder, structures do not move themselves, but pieces can move into or through structures throughout the game. Now let's talk about another structure, my favorite. It's called a trap. Traps are structures unique to the agility realm in Eternal Kings. And instead of being placed in the same space as a creature casting it, they're placed in an adjacent space. And instead of being placed face up, they're actually placed face down. This makes it so that only the player casting the trap knows what it is. Now the trap will be revealed at any point in the game when either my own creature or my opponent's creature steps into the same space that the trap occupies. By doing this, it triggers the trap and an effect happens. So let me show you what this looks like. All right, so check this out. This is the power of traps. Normally, I wouldn't want to kill this mutated brute because it's protected by Kokra who crawls, Strength's queen. But since I have a trap in my hand, I could go ahead and deal the five damage to the mutated brute that my city miscreant does. It's enough to take away his five life and kill him. Now, not only do I get to kill the mutated brute, but since I have this trap in my hand, I can place it by paying its casting cost of three agility and putting it face down in front of my city miscreant. 
Now my opponent isn't gonna know what this trap is, so they might still try and come after my City Miscreant, but I'm actually begging them to do so, because this is the most powerful trap in the game. It's a pyro trap. It deals six damage to any creature that's moving into it. So if this Kokoro who crawls tries to come in after my pawn, I'm gonna get a queen for it. All right, we've gone over all the core mechanics of the game. Now let's go over some frequently asked questions and advanced strategies. The way you win Eternal Kings is by killing your opponent's king. So there's no check, there's no checkmate, and this means that there's no illegal moves as far as where your king can move to or not. So he can castle through check, he can move into a dangerous square if he wants to, but again, the way that you win is by delivering the final blow and killing him. Yes, definitely. You can mix and match creatures from different realms, and the same goes for your ability deck. If you want to have a rook from intelligence and a bishop from strength in the same army, you can do that. Yes, you can castle on Eternal Kings, and it counts as a king's movement. So you could use a king's ability or an ability with a king before or after you choose to castle. And when you do castle, it's like a special move between the king and the rook. The king will move two spaces towards the rook, and the rook will jump over him. They should always land touching each other's squares like this. You could do this on the king's side or on the queen's side, but in either case, the king will move two squares, and the rook will jump over him like this. There are some rules to castling in that they can only be done on the king's very first turn and your rook's first turn. But since there is no check or checkmate in Eternal Kings, you can pretty much do it at any time as long as, again, it's your king's first turn and your rook's first turn. And just remember, this is your king's movement. So if you wanted to, you could use an ability with him at the same time that you castle. So these square icons are a way of determining distance within Eternal Kings. You're gonna see these on a few different abilities for creatures and ability cards. Take Mephesto for instance. Her ability is to flip target creature within two squares. This means that she can use this ability within two squares, one square, or even the square that she's on. Any distance within two squares, in any direction. No, you cannot use Shadow with your Rook as your first turn of the game. This is because Shadow is a white cast ability. We know this since it is written in white. And as a white cast ability, it can only be used from a creature that has been chosen to move this turn. And we know that you can only choose a creature to move who has a legal movement. Right now this Rook has no legal movement, so we can't even choose to move him this turn. And because of that, we're unable to use his ability. However, after I move out my knight, there is a space, a legal movement for my castle crawler to move to. So then I could choose to use his shadow first before I move him, and I do this by spending the two agility and flipping him to gain shadow. Once I've gained shadow, I can then move through one of my ally creatures and bring him to the center of the board. So although we encourage people to mix and match their creatures and ability cards throughout the realms, it's important to note that the zero casting cost ability cards like Uncanny Agility and Unstable Strength are still realm specific. That's why they have that icon specific to their realm. As you'll see, Unstable Strength has the Strength icon and Uncanny Agility has the agility icon. This means that only agility cards, or cards that share that icon, can use uncanny agility. This means that our city miscreant would not be able to use unstable strength to gain force strength until end of turn. Good on you for knowing what en passant is, but there is no en passant in Eternal Kings. Yes, there is pawn promotion in Eternal Kings. When a pawn gets to the other side of the board, it gains the movement of a queen. All of its stats and abilities and creature type will stay the same. However, it will be able to move like a queen from then on. A hero is a king or a queen, as stated within the creature type of each one of their cards. So if an ability states you cannot target a hero or target a non-hero creature, it means you cannot target a king or a queen. 
So for those of you who might not know how chess pieces move already, I'll go ahead and explain that for you. Pawns are the only piece on the chessboard that cannot move backwards and do not attack in the same way they move. They only move forward and they attack in diagonals. So let me show you what that would look like. This pawn could move one space forward and this pawn would move one space forward, taking turns. Now, on the pawn's first turn, it could also have the option of moving two spaces if it wants. So, on my turn, I could move this pawn two spaces instead of just one. You can only do this on a pawn's first turn. Now, if my opponent moved here, he would then be diagonal to me, so I could actually attack this pawn like this and potentially kill him. Or my opponent could move forward two spaces like this. In this case, these pawns would no longer be able to move because they're blocking each other. They cannot capture each other or kill each other because again, pawns only attack in diagonals. The king can move in any direction that he wants. However, he can only move one space at a time. So he can move sideways, he can move up, he can move down, he can move diagonal, any direction that he wants, as long as it's just one space at a time. Again, the whole point of the game is to kill the king. The queen is like the king, in that she can move in any direction that she wants, except she's the most powerful piece on the chessboard. That's because she can move as far as she wants as well, as long as she moves in a straight line and doesn't jump over another piece. No piece on the chessboard can jump over another piece except for the knight. So the queen can move, again, in any direction that she wants, diagonal, down, up, sideways, as far as she wants, as long as she doesn't jump over another piece and she moves in a straight line. The bishop can only move in diagonals. So they'll be staying on the same color throughout the entire game, unless, of course, something moves them off that color. So this bishop can move as far as it wants, but it has to stay on white squares. And this bishop, again, can move as far as it wants, as long as it doesn't jump over another piece, but it has to move on black squares. The rook is the opposite of the bishop. It can move as far as it wants, up, down or side to side, but it cannot move in diagonals. Now the knights are the trickiest piece on the chessboard because they're the only piece on the chessboard that, move, that does not move in a straight line. Instead, they move in an L shape. So this knight can move two spaces in one direction and then one in another. I'll go ahead and place pawns in all the uh, areas at which the knight can move so you can see. It's all in L shapes. So this knight can move here in an L shape, can move here in an L shape. And if you'd like, if it helps, you can, you can sing a little song while you do it too. It goes one, two, and over one. One, two, and over one. Of course, you could also go over one and one, two. But as you see here, the knight attacks in a circle around itself, and it cannot kill or protect any square that it is touching. So lastly, one unique thing about the knight is that it is the only piece on the chessboard that can jump over another piece. All right, everybody, that is our how to play and FAQ for Eternal Kings. We hope that you have a good understanding of the core mechanics of the game. If you have any questions or comments, please do leave those in the comments section below. Don't forget to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, like us on Facebook, and of course, subscribe to this channel. I'm CJ Caldwell, and we look forward to playing Eternal Kings with you soon.